We have a special guest speaker here uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Thomas Kiedis is the president of Lancaster Bible College. Uh, his wife, uh, Shannon, is here as well this morning, uh, and we're happy to have them here. He's fairly new. Uh, he's only been uh, at the college for a couple years, so I thought we'd have him come out, see Pine Grove. We have another number of students there. Uh, I know that uh, Justin Kemper just started his freshman year there. We have a, a couple other students starting in the next year or two. It's actually where I'm doing uh, my doctoral studies right now. So Dr. Key, at the end of the semester, you know, I get, get in trouble, I'm going to bump up those grades a little bit for me. I mean, right? I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, anyway, please welcome Dr. Dr. Kiedis. Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you. It's, it's a dangerous thing when you come in as a guest speaker to bring two messages. But I'm going to bring two this morning. Only because I have to, after Sue shared what, he, what she shared with regard to what's happened with preschool. Cole, good on you for being here and standing up. Uh, as he's standing, I'm thinking about all the good work that God has done. I have to, this verse came to my mind. Um, this is a short sermon. The next one's coming in a minute, okay? Here's what God said. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And we realize that's a responsibility God gives to parents, but it's a beauty when a church gathers together and says, we want to be able to do a portion of that through the work of this preschool. So thanks for having the opportunity to see that. And Cole, particularly in your life, it's really neat to see. And Sue, I think today's the beginning of the NFL season. You would be a phenomenal color commentator. <laughs> Just good stuff. So thanks. Uh, really, really good. It's a delight to be with you. Shannon had to step out for a minute. Some of you might have thought she's angry. She's not. She's fighting a cold. Well, she's not a, it's not a cold. She's getting over it. Um, yep, okay. That's her note to say, honey, shut up, preach, okay? Well, on behalf of Lancaster Bible College and Capital Seminary and Graduate School, I do want to say thanks. Uh, for the opportunity to be here with you and spend a little bit of time this morning as we look into God's Word. And when you come into a situation like this, you come in and say, oh, this is the president. Well, yes, but I look at it like another follower of Jesus. You know, that's who I am. I'm a husband to Shannon, and I am uh, pops to our kiddos and uh, to our grands as well. So Shannon and I make our home here in Lancaster. Uh, well, this is not Lancaster, but Lancaster County. But I grew up in South Florida, and some 43 years ago, I met the woman sitting on the third row back there, and while I was at a Bible college, a tiny little Bible college called Mid-South Bible College, about a year later, we were married, and this uh, what, December, we celebrate our 42nd wedding anniversary, so we're pretty excited about that. But to give you a little bit of background, we have six children, all right, uh, grown children, they're all married. So you can see that there, and they're all having kids. And consequently, we have right now, yeah, we have, we have 24 grands, and we have another one coming on the way. They all come together every summer at our home in Arkansas that we have out. We call it a good crazy because it's kind of insane, but it's a real good time as well. So they're good days, and we're very, very grateful for them. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of background, you know, in terms of us and who we are and where we're coming from. But I think it's also important to know a little bit about the folks to whom God gives you the privilege of speaking. And so with the help of some others, I did a little check-in. And I found out that your pastor and I um, share this unique privilege of God to start our ministry tenure in a new spot coinciding with COVID. Isn't that exciting? You know, 2020. So we've got that connection, Shane. It's a beautiful thing. And your beloved former pastor, Pastor Yoder, uh, has, who served 20 years, and I love having the opportunity to interact with folks that served Jesus for a long period of time, is also a beloved and respected member of our corporation board at LBC. And the third thing that I found out, and there's more I could share on because some of it's already been said about students, the third thing I found out is that you have a heart for missions, and part of the work that you've been doing in missions has to do with supporting some graduate students who are in Uganda. And I was in Uganda in May, and I wish I'd known it sooner, I would have put a picture up on the board, because I was at the commencement service in May, and I want to let you know the work you're doing to invest in those students is paying huge kingdom dividends in Uganda and Ghana and other places over there in Africa. It's absolutely fantastic. I'd love to show you the pictures because those faces are beaming 
uh, in terms of what God's doing. So they're very, very good days. My prayer for our time this morning, uh, when I come into situations like this, because I always walk in a little nervous, I don't know these people, they don't know me, it's going to be okay, and God says, chill out. But part of it is, is to come with the same attitude that Paul does. And Paul comes to the church in Rome, and he writes, and he says, my desire is to impart to you some spiritual gift. And that's my prayer as well this morning, that God would use the time we have together to deliver some spiritual gift into your lives. Now, when I think about that coming from Paul, it's all the more interesting to me because Paul was both apostle, but he was also a preacher. And that is not significant. That is significant because this morning I want to talk about preachers. In particular, I want to talk about the most, you ready for this? Because I'm looking, some of you have been around for a while, so you've heard a lot of preachers. I'm going to talk with you about the most important preacher you will ever listen to. All right, now in order to do this, I'm going to show you a number that's up on the screen here, and that number is 3,000. Now, it may not mean anything to you, but 3,000 is what I consider my preaching number. You say, what do you mean? Well, I grew up in church, a church very similar to this, Uh, A lot of love for the Lord, grew up on the hymns, I'm loving hearing them because I know the words and it's just, it's a neat time. But when I consider starting that time up until now, I've realized I've listened to a lot of preachers in my life and I've heard probably, I I tried to calculate it, probably 3,000 sermons during my lifetime. And I just kind of wonder, when you think about yourself, what's your preaching number? How many sermons do you suspect that you've heard? And I've got to believe that together, if we look at all of us together, we have probably listened to hundreds of preachers and probably thousands. Pastor, you know, it may be safe to say hundreds of thousands servants collectively, you know, when it comes to that. You think about it. Some are good. These guys right here, right? Some not so good. Some serious. Heard serious sermons before? Serious preachers? It's okay to raise a hand right now. Thank you. This is called Make the Preacher Feel a Little More Comfortable. Some serious, some humorous, some are interesting, quite frankly, some maybe a little boring, some who dive deep into God's Word and some kind of drift on the shallow waters, some that inspire us, some that put us to sleep. I hope I am not one of those for you this morning. But we hear lots of different preachers, some with long tenures and some that are kind of fly by night. But as I said, today, I want to talk a little bit about the most important preacher who you'll ever hear. And I can tell you, it's not me. It's you. I think when when it comes to preaching, most people think preaching is something that happens on Sunday and it's something we listen to. But I want to share with you today, and we're going to open up the scriptures and see this, that preaching is actually something that happens every day and it's something that you and I do. So if you have your Bible, look with me over to Psalm 42. I want to start there this morning. Psalm 42. And we're going to look specifically at verses 5 and 11, and then we'll move on to Psalm 56. But I want to begin by reading Psalm 42 uh, and explain what I mean. Now, Psalm 42 is a psalm of a person that loves the Lord. I mean, loves the Lord. Has obviously had a real strong relationship with the Lord, but for some reason, right now, things aren't going too well. And that great sense of confidence this person had, this great sense of God's good, has now begun to diminish a little bit, and they're feeling a little bit like not really in touch. So the psalmist says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, and we're familiar with this, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Well, they say to me all day long, where's your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and song of praise, a multitude keeping festival. And he's in this spot where he says, I can remember what I used to do, and I can remember the sense of where it seemed to be in my relationship with God, but it's just not there today. Today, I'm not feeling it, if you will. And so what does a psalmist do? You can see it right up here. He begins to talk to himself, and he preaches to himself, and he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then in verse 11, why are you cast? He says the same thing. It's like he's, Tommy, 
Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you so bothered? And it's almost like he grabs himself by the lapels. And he says, put your hope in God. He's talking to himself. God's not going to fail you. Put your hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. See what the psalmist is doing? He is, he's preaching to himself. I love the way that um, Paul Tripp describes this, and you'll see this up on the screen. Paul Tripp says, no one, no one is more influential in your life than you are. And this is not pop psychology. He's, He's driving us back into what God says in his word, because no one talks to you more than you do. Isn't that the truth? Some of us are really good at talking to ourselves. Whether you realize it or not, you are engaged in an unending conversation with yourself. And what you say to yourself is formative for the way that you live. You're constantly talking to yourself about your identity, your spirituality, your functionality, mentality, personality, and so on. You're constantly preaching to yourself some kind of gospel. Isn't that true? Maybe this is not for you, but it is for me. I make a mistake, and inside I'm telling myself, you are such an idiot. And then things go well. It's like, nice job. You're not bad. I mean, we have these kinds of things. I get discouraged, and it happens to me. I'm like, God, where are you? And I'll go through a dark place in my walk with the Lord, and I, I know I've grown up. I came to know Jesus at a very young age, but I'll come to that spot and say, God, are you really real? And in my heart of hearts, I know he is, but in my soul, I'm feeling like a little bit disconnected. And in that sense, I'm preaching to myself. Joe Thorne wrote a book uh, called Note to Self, and he, he decides, describes it this way. To preach to yourself is to challenge yourself, to push yourself and point yourself to the truth. It's not so much uncovering new truth as much as it is reminding yourself of the truth you tend to forget. Such a good word. So what I'd like for us to do this morning is I'd like you to look in your Bible and go over to Psalm 56. And we're going to spend the time that we have together in the Psalm 56, and particularly one chapter in the life of King David. And, and what I'm going to share with you is what we're going to talk about today is so important. Because if we're going to become good preachers to ourselves, as David was, then we need to, we need to hear and see what he said, and we need to do what he did. And it's very, very significant. Very, very significant. We need to hear what he said and to do what he did. So if you look at Psalm, verse, Psalm 56, before we ever get to verse 1, the psalmist gives us an introduction. Now, not every psalm gives you introductions, but this one does. And we see here right at the beginning that it tells us where David is and it tells us what's going on in his life. It says, to the choir master, according to the dove on the far off terebinths, a mitkam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Now, according to the dove is is probably a known tune, so this song is sung to that tune. We see those kinds of things today. And a miktam is kind of a somewhat, Pastor Shane or Pastor Yoder could tell you a little bit more about this, but it's, it's, it's a little bit obscure, but it's probably a musical term. One that was familiar to them, maybe not as familiar to us. But the part that I want you to dial in on is it says, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. I want you to think about this. Is the Philistine, are these friends or enemies? I'm asking for a little help this morning. Friends or enemies? They're enemies. So David is among the Philistines. Gath is an enemy stronghold. Now, so I'm asking myself, why is David in Philistine territory, particularly in Gath? Because if you remember Gath, Goliath was from Gath. Not exactly a good place to be. David wouldn't be most favored nation status right now because he's among the people that he killed their hero. So David is there because he's fleeing from King Saul. Saul wants to take him out because Saul's jealous of his power. Jealous is actually God's presence in his life. So David's running for his life, and he runs to the land of his enemies, and he goes to the city of Gath, which is known as the birthplace of Goliath. So David is being chased by his people in enemy territory. He's getting it from both sides. Not a particularly good place to do. So if you're David, you just got to think about this. How are you feeling? My people are chasing me, and I'm in enemy territory. If I'm David, I'm like, God, God, 
are you really at work here? Because this just doesn't seem right. So what does David do in this moment when it seems the world's against him and times are tough? He preaches to himself. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. And then he says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You see this? Look at what David does. Be gracious to me. Oh God, for man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. And then what he says, he says, when I'm afraid, and if you look down a little bit farther, I shall not be afraid. And I'm like, that doesn't compute in my book. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I'm afraid, I'm afraid. I mean, that's the way it works in my life. But this is not the case with David. And I find that so fascinating. So when fear comes knocking on your door, what do you do? Um, fill in the blank. When I'm afraid, I. I was reviewing my message this morning. Our daughter, we have five boys and one girl. Her name's Bethany. She's married to a guy named Brent who's one guy with five sisters. That is an interesting combination. And they had four boys out of the gate, and she finally got a little girl. So... She sends me a text this morning. She says, Daddy, pray, because Titus has got this cough that won't let go of him, and now Grace, who's six or seven months old, has got it as well. And you know how it is. Sometimes little things become, you know, for me, a big thing. It's because I can't control the life of that little one. And fear starts getting a hold of my heart. She can be okay. She can be okay. So when I'm afraid, I, how would you fill in the blank? I get worried. I doubt I'm going to be okay. I run. I hide, I eat, that's a good one right there, I eat, I veg out, when I'm afraid, it may be that you're saying, I don't think God loves me anymore, it just doesn't feel like he does, but when David, and we, we have to hear this, when David gets to this spot, but David says, but when I'm afraid, I will not be afraid, that's powerful. So I'm looking at David's life, and I'm saying, David, how can you be at that spot where you say, when I'm afraid, and you can just see this internal sense of, I will not be afraid. And when we look at Psalm, the rest of the Psalms, we're going to see three things that David does that are fascinating. So let me go back and pick up in verse 5. All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape in wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. And then in verse 8, he said, God, you've kept count of my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And you can see David kind of coming out of this sense of, ah. and he says, then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call, because this I know, God is for me. And then he says it again, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And I love that because I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. There are times when I get a little, I get a little worried. I get a little bothered. I get a little fearful. And David's reminding me, Tommy, there's a, there's a little secret from the Lord here about how you can stand and say, when I'm afraid, I will not be afraid. And I got to hear what David said, and I got to did did, do what David did. And so we see this right here. He goes on, I must perform my vows to you, O God, verses 12. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Now, why is this so important? Because my concern is if, if we don't take the time to stop and remind ourselves and preach to ourselves what we know to be true, the difficulties of life, like a strong current, will just come and start sweeping us away and we'll drift into disappointment and doubt and even despair, thinking God's not there when all the time God says, I've got what you need. And you can be at that spot where you say, when I'm afraid, I will not be 
afraid. When we do what David did, we preach the truth to ourselves. And all David was doing is say, hey, God, God still loves me. God has not forgotten me. God's going to come through when, when it seems like he won't. God has not given up on me. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking at this and saying, wouldn't it be great to have David's kind of confidence? Because a lot of days, I'll walk in and um, my, my predecessor, Dr. Peter Tague, um, Pastor Yona knows him really, really well, uh, led LBC for 21 years. And when I came into this role, one of the things that Dr. Tague told me, he says, Tommy, it just comes at you. <laughs> In other words, sitting in that president's seat, stuff just keeps coming, it keeps coming, it keeps coming. Some are joyful, some are challenging. And we get in those spots, and, and I'd like to have David's confidence, not some days when I'm feeling really strong, but those days when I'm not feeling as strong as well. And David has it, so I'm saying, what's going on in David's life that can help me to be in a similar spot? And I want to share with you three things that we see in here when I look in terms of where David's confidence comes from. And you can jot these down if you like, and just... You'll see them up on the screen. I think David was confident, first of all, because David knew God always keeps his promises. He said in verse 4, in God whose word I praise, and then we see him coming back to it in verse 11, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. Old Testament scholar uh, Derek Kidner said, David, I love this, David is doing, what David is doing is he's denying his feelings of doubt, and clinging to the promise of God's word. And in your mind and, and in mine, we're always going to be in the spot where our, our thoughts of doubt are going to be here and the promises of God are going to be here. And you and I have got to decide, am I going to lean into this feeling of doubt and despair and wondering, God, I'm not feeling okay. My health's not that strong. I've got that dreaded C word cancer. Am I going to be all right? To a God that says, I know your beginning and your end. I have you. You're safe. You're mine. And what's true for David is true for you and me. God keeps his promises. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, every word of God proves true. I look at this and say, you're confused about your future. Well, you know. Proverbs 4.18 says, The paths of the righteous are like the first gleam of the dawn, growing ever brighter as the day unfolds. So I can be very confident about my future, even though despite the fact I'm looking around saying, I don't like the way things are around here. Am I frustrated and feeling alone? We read from Hebrews this morning. Hebrews 13.5 says, Jesus said, I will never, never leave you. I will never, never forsake you. And i got to preach that message to myself. I know it. Sometimes I don't live it. I'm in that spot. This is God's promise. Thinking you've been past the point of forgiveness. I, I'm, I know me. I mean, the only person who knows me better than me is the Lord. And then Shannon. And, but I, I'm like second, all right? The Lord knows me best. I know me second. Shannon probably knows me third. And there are times I said, how can you be so stupid? I can't believe you just did what you did. And sometimes I'm like, Lord, I have blown it. And God comes back. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous. He'll forgive us our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's just that sense. Remember that. Hang on to that promise. When the world screams, there is no God, then I come back to the promise. And, and Psalm 14, the fool says his heart, there is no God. Yesterday, Shannon and I were at, um, what's the name of it, babe? Dutch Meadows Farm. Some of you are familiar with Dutch Meadows Farm. We happened to meet a gentleman when we were there whose name is uh, Lamar Winger, Winger, and he works with honeybees. Um, did it first as, a, as an experience for his daughter who wanted to have a beehive in the backyard. Now it's grown into this massive thing. He's become quite an expert on honeybees. He said worker bees, think about this, a worker honeybee produces one-twelfth of a teaspoon during that worker bee's existence, which is about 35 days which means it takes 20,000 to 60,000 honeybees to provide what they need to get them going. The queen bee lays 2,000 eggs a day. A, a worker bee can visit as many 2,000 flowers a day. And a bee's brain measures a cubic millimeter, and yet there are a million neurons going on inside of that cubic millimeter. 
And the world says, oh, that's just chance. That, that's just, you know, a product of chance. Uh-uh. The fool says in his or her heart, there is no God. And when I'm in that spot, I've got to come to that place. Psalm 139, verse 14. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David was confident because he knew that God keeps his promises. So he preached to himself in light of not how he felt, but in light of what God said. Second thing I want you to see is that God cares about the little things. And we need to hear this because we know God's really concerned about what's going on in Ukraine. And we know God's concerned about who's in the White House or not. But God put one, lays, puts one up, lays one down. I mean, it's part of his work. But does God really know about what's going on in my backyard? Does he really care about that? And the psalmist says this, you've kept count of my tossings. You put my tear in your bottles. Are they not in your book? And David, David was so confident because he, he knew that God was sovereign over his uh, daytime wanderings and his nighttime tossings. Okay, I'm going to ask him. I won't ask you to do this too many times, but just raise your hand. How many of you have ever tossed and turned at night? We've all been there, haven't we? Something's keeping us up, and we're thinking, oh, oh. God says, I'm keeping track. Every time you flip, every time you turn, I got that. Every time you cry a tear, God says, I catch that in my bottle. Actually, I've written everyone down his work. And the psalmist is helping us to see that God cares about the little things. And when we get that God cares not only about the big things, but God cares about the little things, then when we encounter some of those difficulties, what happens is we start preaching to ourselves, hey, don't believe the fact that God's not thinking about you right now. Don't buy the fact that the evil one says God doesn't care about you right now. God's got you. And God's got this. He cares about even the tiniest of things. I love what Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus. So my question is, what's keeping you up at night? God says, I've got that. I've got that. Preach to yourself. He does care and he's got it. David was confident. David was confident, one, because because David knew God always keeps his promises. And David was confident because he knows that God cares about the little things. And third, David was confident because God was for him. Psalm 56, 9 is one of my favorite verses in all the scripture. This I know that God is for me, David says. And in that respect, any person, any one of us in here, plus God, is a majority. And it doesn't matter who's facing against us. Psalm 18, verse 29, David says, For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. I love it. I was thinking this morning, 2 Kings 6, uh, 16, Elisha's there with his servant, and his servant's freaking out because all around him are the Arameans, and they're the bad guys. And he's just worried and bothered. Am I going to be okay? And, and Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. Oh, first Elisha says this, Those who are with us, this is hilarious, those who are with us, and it's Elisha and this guy, (laughs) are more than those who are with him. And he's looking around, he's saying, doesn't seem that way to me because I'm seeing nothing but the bad guys. And then Elisha says this, Lord, open his eyes. And all around there were the angels and the power of God. Such an important thing for us to remember. Any person plus God's a majority. And David knew in that sense that God was for him. And you may, you may not be standing like the, against the army of Gath like David was, but you may be facing, some of you, an army of criticism or an army of fatigue. Some of you are just so flat, worn out. You're tired. Or an army of disappointment or a wall of sickness or a wall of loneliness or a mountain of debt or a mountain of confusion. And God says, hey, with my help, you can leap over that wall because I am for you. And then David, in the midst of that time where he's just feeling like everybody's against me, said, when I'm afraid, I am not going to be afraid (laughs) because he knew that. So we we can stand confident because we know that God is is for us. And I think sometimes we look at that and say, yeah, I hear you, you know, 
I hear you, Tommy. I hear Dr. Ketis. I, I see what you're saying. It sounds good, but how do I really know? That was David. How do I really know? And I think the way we really know is because when we were at our worst, God is always at his best. Romans 6, 6 to 8. Look at this, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. In, Psalm, in Romans 6, 6 to 8. So, so while we were still weak, at, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God chose his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what's true in Psalm 56, 9 is true throughout the scriptures. God is for you. And you say, well, I hear you, but how do I really know God is for me? He proved it at the cross. And the message of the gospel is, is, is as simple as, and it's not simple as good news, bad news, good news. I mean, the good news that you and I are made to be in a relationship with the God who spoke the world into existence, that's mind-boggling. But the bad news is, Romans 3.23, every one of us has walked away from God and the wages of sin is death. And we walk away from God in what we think, our minds wander, we walk away from God in what we say, we know we say things that don't please Him, we walk away from God in terms of things that we do. And God says the wages of that sin, the payoff, our paycheck for that is death. And death there is, is physical death. We're all going to die. We know that. But it, and it's eternal death. We're going to be separated from God forever. But it's, but it's spiritual death, the sense that we're made to know God, but we, we can't experience him. We know he's out there, but I just don't feel that. But the good news is that God found a way, not found a way, but made a way for you and I, who were made to know him, but became his enemies, to become his children. And it's what he did for us through Jesus. And I love the way Peter puts it. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all. The righteous, that's Jesus. <laughs> for the unrighteous, that's me. To bring us to God. And he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's like, God, how do I really know you're for me? And God says, here's, here's what you do. Just look back at the cross. I want you to think about what I did for you, the unrighteous one, to make you a righteous one, to put you declared righteous in God's eyes through the work that Jesus did. So Paul, he continues, and what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And my heart can really rest when I understand the gospel. And the gospel is I don't deserve anything from God. Nothing. And I don't have to try to win God's favor because I never could. And Paul says in the same way you receive Christ Jesus, continue to walk in him, which just means just depend on his grace and his goodness. And so even if I'm at that spot where I'm like, God, I think I've really blown it. God says, hey, keep preaching the truth to yourself. I love you. I've proven it through the work of my son on the cross, on your behalf. And so when you get to that spot, when you say, like, you can be like David, when I'm afraid, I will not be afraid. Because this I know, God is for you. He proved it. There to David, he proves it at the cross. And as we put our faith and trust in him, we rest confident. It's not by our strength and power but it's by his. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know God is for me. And he is for you. Let's pray. God, thanks for um, letting us see through the eyes of someone like David who <laughs> A man after your own heart that we know struggled and yet you used in amazing ways. Who, despite his absolute great confidence in you, we know he was in times when he just didn't feel it. And things were not going like they thought. And yet he was able to say, when I'm afraid, I'm not going to be afraid. Because he preached to himself. And Lord, I pray that you would help me. I pray that you would help us to anchor our hearts to the truth of your word. To have that steady intake of your word so, Lord, when we get into those difficult times, we come back and we preach to ourselves the truths, that you keep your promises, you care about the little things, you are for us. David tells us that, 
The gospel shows us that. Help us live in that reality, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please.